wherever you're listening in the world. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Israel Cast, the podcast powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. I'm Stephen Shalowitz. First, reminding you that for over 120 years, Jewish National Fund USA has been the premier philanthropic movement for the land and people of Israel. While best known for planting trees in Israel, JNF USA contributes to Israeli life in so many ways, including community development in the Negev and the Galilee, preservation of heritage sites, supporting people with disabilities, and connecting high school and college students to Israel. To learn more and to see how you can contribute, do visit jnf.org. Once again, hope you got it, jnf.org. All right, as for this episode, our featured guest is Olga Deutsch, Vice President of NGO Monitor, a globally recognized research institute promoting democratic values. Now, a word or two about Olga. She graduated from the University of Belgrade and University of Munich with degrees in banking, insurance, and finance. She was awarded a fellowship with the Ford Motor Company, graduating as a community leader at the School of International and Public Affairs of Columbia University right here in New York City. Before making Aliyah in 2009, she served as the chairperson of the European Union of Jewish Students, an umbrella organization for 34 national unions, In 2008, she received the International Leadership Prize from the American Jewish Committee. And over the past 12 years, Olga has held senior positions in the private sector in Europe and Israel. Olga is fluent in Serbian, English, Hebrew, and German. And she joins us now via Zoom from her home in Petah Tikva. Welcome to the program, Olga. Thank you for having me, Stephen. It's wonderful to be with you here. Well, it's wonderful to have you join us. And I must say that my Serbian is a little bit rusty. So we are going to conduct this interview in English, if that's okay with you. I think we will do fine in English. (laughs) All right. I think we will. Well, listen, let's get started and really take a step back and talk about NGO Monitor. I absolutely love what you do. But for the uninitiated, share with us the work of the organization, its backstory, because I know you were founded after the 2001 so-called UN World Conference Against Racism in Durban. Well, that is correct. But, you know, before I go into in, into details and I tell the full blown story of how the organization was created 20 years ago and by uh, by whom and what was its main purpose. If I have to give an elevator pitch or just a one liner on what it is that we really do in today's context, the easiest way to explain is just to say that we defend Israel's right to exist as a Jewish democracy within the human rights space, period. And everything is human rights based, especially today in 2022, almost 2023, as we are uh, recording this, um, everything connects and interconnects and intersects in some way with human rights. So to be more precise, we look into the activities of so-called human rights, Mm non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and they can range from major in names like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, all the way to smaller ones, Palestinian groups like al Haq that no one outside of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has ever heard of, and all the way to random German groups like Kurve Wustro that even Germans haven't, uh, haven't heard of. And we try to record those cases in which instead of promoting human rights, they seek to harm Israel, to delegitimize it, to promote anti-Semitic narratives, to promote boycotts, uh, divestment and sanctions against Israel, and in certain cases have ties to terror. They basically abuse their mandate of promoting human rights and protecting the uh, the weak in order to promote a very politicized agenda, which is denying Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. Can you talk how they actually do that and what are some of their activities? Because I don't think people know. So you 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 mentioned uh, Durban, uh, the Durban, the UN conference in two thousand and one, that we, which was held in Durban, South Africa. That's where the, this whole um, industry or campaign, as we call it, started. In parallel to the official UN conference in Durban, there was a uh, there was a, an NGO uh, summit, and all the major human rights groups gathered there to discuss. Uh, how they will defend, uh, the, how they will fight racism, and instead of doing that, they came up with the with the full blown strategy of blaming Israel for the gravest violations of human rights. This is the the, the place where, uh, after years, we hear the slogan "Zionism is racism" for the first time again, and this is where 
BDS as we know it today was initiated as a campaign. Now, how do they do that? They lobby governments to, to in order to promote uh, anti-Israel resolutions, policies, legislations, and so on. Um, they lobbied the United Nations uh, so that the Human Rights Council would issue one after another resolution only uh, uh, condemning Israel and singling it out. Uh, they lobby for sanctions um, uh, in the international forums against Israeli uh, co companies. They lobby for, for companies to divest from Israel. They lobby for artists not to perform. Um, they they basically do not want, in one hand, Israel to exist as a Jewish state. They exploit literally every platform that you can think of and all in the name of human rights. And so in a way, they have successfully identified that the world it, it, in its entirety is moving towards a more just society. And they have they are exploiting it in order to harm uh, the Jewish community, the global Jewish community, by by attacking uh, by attacking Israel, and what we do is we call them out, we research, um, we issue reports on on how they abuse their mandate, but then we add another layer to that, and in that sense, we are very unique because many other groups will say, you know, Amnesty International's report uh, from earlier this year saying that Israel is apartheid you know, is uh, is clearly a libel and it's horrific. And all the major groups condemned it. But we are the only group that knows how to research every footnote and reference it to which sources they used, how they exactly distorted the truth. And we add another layer, and that is we answer the question who funds all these groups. Mm -hmm. Most of these so-called human rights uh, NGOs are funded by taxpayers' money through official development and aid programs, meaning in simple words, governments allocate certain amounts of money to promote human rights and humanitarian causes, to promote democracy, sustainable development, and so on in third countries. And much like in many other places, they're also vested in the, in the Palestinian context and in the context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But they tend to fund all these NGOs that instead of promoting human rights and building democracy for the Palestinian society, they promote boycotting Israel or uh, sanctioning it in international forums. So we also go to these donor governments and we share our research with them in calling them to either stop the funding, defund these groups, or to change their policies so that it doesn't happen in the future that they will end up funding anti-Semitic NGOs or groups that have ties to terror. There's a lot to unpack there, Olga. And the first one is, which are those NGOs, which are the biggest violators, would you say? We need to zoom out for a second and paint the, the phenomenon, right? Paint the picture, understand its magnitude. We're talking about uh, a market, as we call it, that in average... Um, is fueled by around $120 million uh, each year through, through governments around the world, mainly developed uh, countries. But in, 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 there are hundreds of NGOs around the world, but those focusing on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and abusing their mandate, we're talking about between 50 and 100 groups where 30, 40 are the most active. So if you boil it down to that, we understand that it's actually incredible amounts of money that are being streamed towards a very uh, small group of, of organizations. Now, again, I bet that's some, and they're lethal. They're really lethal. And our research shows that uh, there is a, an incredible disproportionate you know, focus on Israel Right. I mean, disproportional to any other conflict in the world uh, in any way, whether it is its magnitude, number of victims, uh, the, the, you know, the number of incidents. Uh, for some reason, people like to obsess about Israel because everything tends to to be politicized. Um, some of these groups, again, are um, smaller Palestinian groups. And there's a, a Palestinian uh, terror organization, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is a designated terror group by the US, Canada, EU, and Israel. And it has its own NGO network. Uh, there's 13 Palestinian non-governmental organizations that are affiliated to PFLP. All of them go by the name human rights groups, and they promote 
human rights, uh, so to speak. But in, in effect, as we said, they abuse their mandate and they, A, are affiliated to a terror group, but B, they, um, they, uh, they proactively delegitimize Israel. Actually, some of them are the main proponents of the uh, um, libel, uh, apartheid libel against Israel at the UN and in the International Criminal Court in The Hague, because those are the two venues where this libel is uh, um, mainly displayed. They are trying to build a legal case in the United Nations uh, with the Commission of Inquiry, which will then implicate Israel and build a criminal case against it at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Some of the groups are actually European groups that uh, promote, you know, that promote human rights, but they partner with these Palestinian groups and they are extremely ideological and um, they will say that they are not anti-Semitic. They merely criticize Israel, but their criticism goes way beyond uh, criticizing what, what, what would constitute criticize, legitimate critici critique of any democratic country, right? Because uh, they're singling out Israel, they're completely distorting the reality and so on. And then some of these groups are humongous, like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. And they're extremely dangerous because they come with the, we call it our founder, Professor Gerald Steinberg, who created NGO Monitor 20 years ago. He calls it the halo effect, right? Around, uh, uh, around these groups because they are trusted almost blindly by the public. The main media outlets quote them as, uh, absolute authorities on any issue that they pick up. Uh, Amnesty International reports are uh, weighted, you know, and anticipated and reported on by media. Uh, so when they issue a report saying that Israel is an apartheid, then people listen to it. And especially broader public that is not knowledgeable about the conflict and not knowledgeable about Israel. And the only thing that they will maybe know is a few minutes from the news uh, that almost always had have, have to do with with the with the conflictuous situation. Yeah, because people know Amnesty International and the good side of what they do. For example, when they talk about the Rohingya in Myanmar, right, and though that group then being persecuted, and so again, it's that halo effect because they'll say, "Hey, they were on the money." on this group, so they have to be then on the money when it comes to Israel. It's important to unpack, you know, how these groups work, because they'll have their local staffers in different countries where they operate and uh, in, in different countries where they where they write their reports or, or, or uh, research. And what tends to happen when it, especially in the Israeli context, is that they uh, they hire extremely politicized individuals to begin with that bring their own agendas into this. And then they also work in, a, they, they choose to cooperate with other local NGOs who are politically like minded. So it, it, it's like an echo chamber that is created that feeds its own narrative and serves as its own source of information. They will never question it. And um, and they tend to reference in their reports one to another. So so that that's uh, that's why uh, we see an ex such a bias when it comes to Israel. Olga, can we talk about the research that NGO Monitor then does? Uh, talk about the process and then who is actually seeing the end result of that research? So we are, um, we, I can use fancy terms to describe how, how our researchers uh, do their work. We have a very intelligent audience, so go ahead and use <laughs> the fanciest terms that you know, Olga. But I'm, but I'm not going to. At the end of the day, we Google. You know, I mean, there's obviously a, a, an entire methodology behind what we do, and we know um, we understand the funding mechanisms of different uh, governmental um, uh, frameworks, uh, and we know their in, ins and outs, and we know exactly when they will publish and release information. When we meet with governmental officials, they usually are surprised because we tend to know uh, what what their government funds better than they do and we are always almost always better prepared than them we also follow the the work of the organizations we um we follow their reports we follow the, them on social media we follow their public appearances and we analyze it and cross-reference it 
Um, but all our, our all research is found is uh, solely based on open source information. We have no intelligence uh, capacity, no special um, powers, or no secret methods, uh, and that is part of what we. What, but that's part of our message. That is part of our uh, claim. We basically say, if we can do it, then anyone can do it. If we can. Google and research these groups and figure out relatively easily how they distort their proclaimed agenda, which is to protect human rights and promote uh, democracy, then the same should be the case with governments who spend taxpayers' money, but they don't. And that is where the second part of what we do uh, kicks in, because we research, but we don't research for the sake of research like a typical uh, institute, right? We are like, if you would like, we are uh, think and do tank because <laughs> we then take our reports um, and we share them with decision makers and we call on them to make policy changes to uh, introduce better vetting procedures to check to introduce better better um, uh, processes on who they partner how they choose them and if they catch them on uh, red-handed right promoting anything from fraudulent uh, behavior from uh, promoting anti-Semitic narratives or, God forbid, being affiliated to terror groups, what type of sanctions they should uh, they should uh, apply. So that that's basically what we do, and it's all solely based on on open source information. So when you share this information with governments, whom are you sharing it with in those governments, and what's their response? Well, our reports are uh, publicly available to everyone. On our website, you we have a exhaustive database of uh, all NGOs that we research and that are in one way or another involved or active in the context of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But proactively, we share our information with the Israeli officials. We share information with the uh, European members of the parliament. We have... Uh, regular meetings with uh, European and other American, Canadian, Australian diplomats here in Israel. We make it our business to meet with every ambassador and his or her staff at least once a year to brief them and communicate in between more often, uh, share our reports. But we also sometimes when um, we run campaigns. So for example, in uh, 2019, some of your uh, listeners and viewers uh, probably read, in August 2019, uh, there was a terror attack near Jerusalem. Uh, an explosive was detonated, and a 17-year-old girl, Rina Schnurb, was murdered. She went on a uh, for a walk with her father and brother, and she was uh, killed on spot. And a few months later, Israeli security forces arrested a 50-people terror cell affiliated to PFLP, uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a designated terror group. And what was revealed is that at least five of these 50 were senior employees of Palestinian human rights NGOs. I mean, one has to stop for a second just for that piece of information to sort of <laughs> linger, you know. Um, and they were charged, they were accused for senior involvement in the terror attack. One was accused of being the one who detonated the explosive, the other one for recruiting the whole cell, the third one for managing, for like commanding the whole operation. And in the NGOs, they had senior positions, financial director, um, the CEO, and so on. Once we realized that and we uh, we knew from our research that all these NGOs were at that moment of the terror attack funded by the EU and a few other European governments. We launched a very uh, a huge campaign in Europe uh, with the governments. We worked with local uh, uh, pro-Israel and Jewish groups and we alerted the members of the parliament. We shared the reports. We had talks with them. And once they realized what was going on, they th themselves uh, mobilized and they started writing to their com to their commissioners and ministers and um, uh, and relevant people, which led to a, a series of investigations. And we can we can go into um, the you know the impact of our research because as I said previously, we don't research just for the sake of releasing the reports, and we can talk about the results of of, of our work over the last uh, uh, two decades. Um, because that is actually how we measure 
our success. It's not just by raising awareness and sharing uh, information to the public, but it's all by answering the question, did we actually change something um, in practice? Can you address the successes? Sure. Um, so in the last 10 years, I can tell you that our research helped defund over 100, 100 million US dollars in funding to anti-Israel NGOs. And that can you is repeat a very that statistic? Say, say that statistic again and let that linger. Sure. <laughs> so um, in the last 10 years, NGO Monitor's research help, directly helped defund, cut funding uh, in the value of 100 million US dollars to anti-Israel NGOs. And that European money was, and other was governments. that's what I was going to ask you. It's coming mostly from Europe or where is it coming from? It's coming mostly from the EU and other European governments. Some of it was from the US, some from Canada, some from Australia. There's a, there's a historical explanation to that. Um, and I'll try to be con short in explaining it. Um, in, in, for example, in the US, most of the charities are supported through individuals or family foundations or businesses, right? That is the model uh, of the charity work in, in the States. In Europe, uh, after the Second World War, um, the governments themselves wanted to make sure that there is a mechanism that would not allow another Hitler um, and Nazi Germany to rise. Basically, they wanted stronger democracies. And they, they said, we need a thriving civil society that can be politically active without running for office, right? And because businesses, there was no tradition for businesses to support that, uh, the government said, this is our goal. So we will start investing. And, and it has become a... a a, a sort of a value uh, for all European, particularly Western European governments, to allocate certain uh, percentages and significant percentages of their of their uh, budgets to aid, and a lot of that aid is channeled to or through NGOs around the world. But again, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there is a disproportionate focus. So again, in the last ten years, from a variety of governments, our research helped cut. $100 million in funding to anti-Israel groups. When it comes to the terror-affiliated groups, uh, in the last two years, we cut around $30 million um, of funding that would have went to, the, to, the, to these groups. And all our um, estimates are pretty conservative because, as you can imagine, it's not that simple to measure uh, and to count. There is very little transparency, particularly on the side of the NGOs. Most of them don't report any financial uh, reports. Um, most of the information we actually get from the governments and their websites and reports and uh, um, and uh, financial statements. But of what we are what we were able to cut to to account for, we put in that statistics. But that is not even our biggest impact. It is the one that sounds. Uh, probably most impressive because we can put a number on it. But if you think about it, defunding, cutting funding to uh, any one NGO is a one-off event, right? If you don't teach the system um, why it made the mistake in funding an anti-Semitic or you know, terror-affiliated NGO in the first place, then it will end up making that mistake again. So the real impact is the fact that our research helped only in the last five years, change NGO funding policies in 15 countries around the world. And those, those range from uh, a law, like Switzerland uh, a few years back passed a legislation, a law that says Swiss uh, money, Swiss government will not fund organizations that, are, that promote anti-Semitism, hate, and or have ties to terror. And it can go from there to changing uh, or adding uh, requirements in the contracts between governments and NGOs or uh, introducing Danish government, introducing specific guidelines on Danish governmental funding to Palestinian NGOs and so on and so on. So, and those are much, uh, much more significant impacts because they are longer lasting, right? They are institutional solutions that are supposed to not only prevent funding today, uh, to hateful groups, 
but actually uh, uh, enable a government to prevent such a case in future as well. So the budgets get cut for these NGOs. What's the impact on the NGO? And is there a corresponding impact then on the rates and the severity of terrorist activities? Well, we can't, you know, ours is not, we are not a, a security um, agency. So we don't even claim that these groups, di- that they, um, that they uh, redirect European or governmental taxpayers' money to, t- to terror activities. We, there's no way for us to know that. Um, that would be a conversation to have with the Israeli government, right, or an Israeli security uh, apparatus. We can say that they are affiliated to a terror group, which automatically makes them a hateful group, right? And that no one who is openly affiliated to a designated terror group can be a proper, a decent partner for promoting human rights. Now, we know from their, uh, we, we know from uh, the statements by the governments that the funding was frozen, but we also know on their end, um, uh, last month, uh, one, one of these NGOs uh, was uh, speaking at the uh, uh, United Nations Commission of Inquiry uh, um, uh, investigating Israel that was created to investigate Israel. And they blamed us there. You know, they were accusing us for cutting their institutional donors. And that is another word for different governmental uh, sources of funding um, from 47 to 5. So, you know, if, it, if, you, if you don't want to trust me in our counting, then, you know, you can take their word uh, for it. I do think that, um, that it is significant and, it, and, and our impact has been significant on two accounts. One is a financial matter. This funding is existential for them. These groups are almost entirely funded uh, through governments, uh, but the second account is the reputational damage by by there i think that the damage uh, of all these groups being now affiliated and associated to to a terror group and being discussed as terror affiliated um is even great, graver than the financial damage um but these two together um are, it's like cutting their their um their oxygen, and they they have been they have functioned as uh, main partners for the European governments in uh, uh, in in anything and everything related to human rights, so so to speak, for for over twenty years. I'm just wondering, Olga, when you have an ambassador from a European country, from an EU member state, come into your offices for a briefing, their yearly briefing. What's their response? What are those conversations like? Well, those are not easy. Uh, a diplomat's job in any one country is not to seek confrontational <laughs> uh, conversations. It's quite the opposite, right? The, their job is to promote uh, thriving bilateral relations and uh, to present their country in the best light. So they're not they're not very um, eager and keen on having this kind of conversation. Um, but also, no one likes to 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 be criticized. Um, they usually uh, repeat the official message from their capitals, and uh, and do not necessarily engage uh, further in that. Ours is to inform them because they are officially the emissaries, right, of their countries. But the real work, uh, vis-à-vis any one government, happens in the in their parliaments and happens with their officials. We go and we meet also with their, uh, with the representatives of their ministries of foreign affairs and in, in in countries where there's a ministry of development and so on, but but we and we meet with uh, with members of the parliament and we brief them. It is not our job to uh, demand accountability. It is actually the job of uh, of their members of the par- parliament and their local citizenship, right? because it's their taxpayers' money. Ours is to inform them and to shed light on the questions that they can ask. So um, they are often dismissive. They often ignore to answer the questions. Who's dismissive, the ambassadors or the parliamentarians? 
No, the ambassadors and the officials, right? Because again, it no one, no one, um, no, no diplomat will will um, easily say, "Oh, you're right. Yes, we received your brief, and we we uh, realized that we were funding a terror affiliated NGO for ten years." Um, <laughs> uh, in certain cases, some of the um, some of these uh, officials are very ideological, so we would have a very uh, um, interesting um, political debate. They will say that it's a. They will say it's the Palestinian right to um, to protest, you know, and they will say, well, every Palestinian was uh, arrested at some point, so it, that's not really a a point. Some of them are there, and 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 some of those actually reflect their their government's uh, positions on uh, the two state solution and where they think uh, what they think the solution in the region should be. Um, it, it's very much, it very much depends on, on the official politics of that country. Um, but we find more receptive audience, at least to listen to what we have with the elected officials. And their response, around the world. Around, and their responses are? Some are shocked, right? Some are some are extremely ideological. You know, typically, if you meet a, a left leaning member of the parliament in Europe, they will not they will not be very receptive, and they will be very dismissive because they will say resistance in all its forms is legitimate. Which it's a political discussion. You and I will probably agree that no resistance, not in all its forms is, because uh, if it's a violent resistance, then it's not legitimate. You know, you want to resist and resist verbally to, to debate me, you know, find uh, um, democratic uh, and legal tools that do not physically violate or endanger uh, and others, definitely not civilians, right? And innocent people. Uh, but some of them will say resistance in all its forms is legitimate. Um, Even terrorist yes. activities, because they do, some of them don't view uh, Hamas and, and PFLP as a, as terrorist groups. They see them as liberators. They see them as human rights defenders. Um, and and in in many ways, they're I, I I think that they're victims of the Palestinian propaganda, because if you think about it, and I always uh, use this argument with the European diplomats. If you think about it, these groups are first and foremost betraying the Palestinian people because instead of really working on women issues in the Palestinian society or LGBTQ issues, right, or really uh, addressing uh, health care uh, access issues and so on and so on, they everything becomes... Yes, occupation, no occupation. Everything become everything is seen through the lenses of the uh, of the conflict, and it's so easy and convenient uh, for all of them to blame Israel for everything, for all their sorrows. So, in a way, it's a very um, it's it's a very convenient propaganda that, to my mind, first and foremost betrays. The Palestinian people, because there is absolutely no progress on building their society to ever become self-sustainable and demo uh, self-sustainable democracy. But many, many, some politicians, particularly left-leaning and far left-leaning, uh, would debate us and debate us very, uh, you know, and would not even meet with us. So, it, it that that is exactly the problem. You know, we, if I am asked to summarize what is the problem. I always say it is the politicization of human rights. You know, no, it, it, nothing, no issue um, is seen in absolute terms. Everything is a matter of who offers his or her political interpretation. I don't want to get too sidetracked, Olga, but I'm just really curious. Are those left-leaning politicians... I don't know how to ask this, limited to one country. Do you see it across Europe, across the geography of the EU, for example, or are they concentrated in pockets that you've identified? No, you see that not only Europe, you see that also in the state, you, you see that across the globe, right? Yeah. Uh, even in, in the states, in the Democratic Party, you have 
uh, you have uh, members who are much further to the left, and 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 there you will also find much more vocal Israel critiques and supporters of BDS and you know um, uh, terror affiliated groups. You see that in Canada as well, and in Europe it goes across the board. Now, yes, you could say that. Um, Nordic countries like Norway and Sweden and Denmark, they tend to be uh, more liberal in general um, uh, than the Southern European countries. You could talk, uh, you could say that the Central Eastern European bloc uh, in general is more pro-Israel uh, oriented, but but you will find all kinds of politics across the board, right? And if a few years ago we would have uh, had this conversation, I would have told you that uh, the left is on the rise. But nowadays, actually, the right is on the rise in Europe. Sweden just had its elections and it just elected, elected its most right-wing government. Uh, in Italy, they just appointed uh, uh, a prime minister who is uh, whose party is a descendant of a pro-Nazi party, right? Uh, you have uh, uh, in um, in Netherlands, you have Wilders, and in France, La Pen's party. It, there's there's a uh, in Germany, you have AfD, who is uh, uh, consistently over the years gaining uh, gaining power and uh, and more votes. So. There, there are these trends, right? And it's uh, the, the the two are fighting. And right now, Europe is seeing an increase uh, in right wing uh, parties. And there's a multitude of explanations. I, I think COVID is one of them. The war in Ukraine is another one where people are saying we want to see stronger leadership. I mean, we see it even in Israel, right? I mean, we are we are about to uh, to swear in one of the. Uh, not one of the the most right wing government that Israel has seen since its creation. So, I think it's a it's it's a global trend. Well, thanks for that. Um, I want to move on to anti semitism, Olga, and I don't have a question in particular for you, but I just want you really just to comment on the rise in anti semitism, the spike. Indeed, that we're seeing right now. I heard you say in an interview, it's a phenomenon of a broader issue, and I'd really love you to expand on that thought. Well, it 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 is a a, a disease, right? It's the the oldest hatred uh, in the book, and um, wiser people than me have said that, and I I agree one hundred percent, and I I like to use that. Um, that anti-Semit, the level of anti-Semitism in any one society is a pretty good barometer of the overall state of the art when it comes to liberties and democracies and, and human rights in that society, by and large, right? Because as they say, it almost always starts with the Jews, but it never ends with the Jews. And um, when societies are in some sort of distress, um, and in times of crisis, people tend to look for uh, someone to blame, for a culpable group. And historically, Jews have uh, uh, have served as a convenient group to to blame. Uh, but it almost always uh, preempted much bigger societal changes and crises, and that were and and uh, disruptive processes. What is unique or different? today, right, in, in, in our modern times, is uh, the existence of the state of Israel and the centrality that Israel, um, uh, the, the central place that Israel has, even outside of Israel, in, all the anti, in a lot of the anti-Semitic attacks. Um, Jews are being attacked for what Israel is doing, for its policies or for its Jews are being attacked um, for merely stating that they are Zionist, which at the end of the day just means I have a, a homeland somewhere. I mean, everyone is came from somewhere, right? Uh, and I, you know, I have relatives there, and I like the country. Um, I think um, a few years ago we would have spoken about 
yet another rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. But that almost doesn't surprise anyone, right? Because that's uh, uh, we're used to, sadly, to seeing physical and verbal and other anti-Semitism in Europe. But what we are seeing in the last couple of years, and and that is the really frightening uh, part, is that anti-Semitism is on a hor hor horrific rise in, in the United States, a country that all of us are used to talk about in terms of a safe haven for the Jewish community, a thriving Jewish community that has its place, um, uh, a democracy that knows how to um, allow each individual to cherish their heritage and religion and while in celebrating their, their Americanness, right? And all of a sudden, we see that exactly in that place, that it's almost like the, the American democracy is being attacked, right? <laughs> Through the rise of, of anti-Semitism. And we see it everywhere. Physical attacks on Jews, campuses. Uh, it is horrific what is happening on campuses. And our issues, NGO monitor issues, are center stage in that. Why? Because a lot of these attacks are done in the name of human rights and in the name of inclusiveness, right? In the name of, uh, you know, if uh, creating a just uh, and uh, inclusive environment by excluding Jews. And whether they, they are called Jews or Zionists, it doesn't matter. It's almost, um, it's almost they, as if they replace the word Jew by the word Zionist and that should make it okay, right? So I can say a, a blatantly anti-Semitic line just by targeting Zionists instead of Jews, but but it, it boils down to the same thing. Um, and and the effect to on the Jewish community is, I think, the most devastating on two accounts. I think for the first time in a very long time, Jews feel physically threatened and don't feel safe wearing uh, stars of David or, you know, recognizable Jewish symbols or kippahs, et cetera. But I also think that it, this, this whole discourse and the politicization of everything uh, that has to do with Israel and our relationship with Israel um, has created a rift inside of the, the Jewish people, inside of the Jewish community. A lot of the, a lot of the, the disputes that we have amongst us are about Israel, how, whether we agree on the government or whether we don't agree on the government, wh how, we, how we view that the conflict should be resolved or not resolved. And, 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 and we have allowed um, that hateful um, anti-Semitic talk to penetrate our community from within and divide us and split us. And I think, um, I think those two trends are, 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 terrifying they're really uh really scary so how do we then begin to reduce the amount of anti-semitism and really get to the core issue and i ask this question as someone that grew up with a lot of anti-semitism in suburban chicago uh without going into a whole laundry list of of things that i certainly experienced and there was a time where i felt it was dormant but it was always there and now we're seeing that the lid has been taken off. And so how do we put the lid back on? But importantly, how do we turn off the flame? Well, I think to my mind, there, there need to be uh, two parallel processes. On one hand, education, 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 right? We have to take a positive approach and we have to educate people um, maybe we got too comfortable <laughs> uh, for too long. It doesn't even matter, but we are now at the, in, a, in a place where obviously too many people don't really know who Jews are and what Judaism is and, uh, and what our connection to Israel is. So we have to educate. But at the same time, we also have to um, firmly sanction those that are caught in anti-Semitic deeds. And we, we need our governments to have a firm hand that and a firm to come with a firm position and say this will not be tolerated. This is not welcome in our country, in our society. And I think that these two things in parallel um, are the only way we can take. Now there, there's a variety of tools, right? We also need to 
uh, talk about, we need to start with what is anti-Semitism today. Um, not everyone will agree on what constitutes anti-Semitism. Right now, the most accepted uh, definition on anti-Semitism, a practical one, or not a, not a academic decision, is the so-called International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition on anti-Semitism, IHRA, um, that has a very simple, you know, few lines on, on what is anti-Semitism, but then it has 11 examples from practical life attached to it that should guide any uh, anyone who sh who uses it in uh, e in figuring out what what is and what is not anti-Semitic. So some of the things, uh, half of those examples deal with what you what we would call uh, classic old school anti-Semitism, but the other half addresses Israel-related anti-Semitism. And the definition will say criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic. It's okay, you know. We can engage in a in a discussion, in a critical discussion on Israeli policies, and we can disagree. And I I'm free uh, to criticize Israel like any other country, but that's exactly where the definition raises the bar and says. But singling out Israel and judging it on double standards that one would not apply on any other country is anti-Semitic, or accusing uh, a Jew in Chicago, right, and attacking him for. Uh, the uh, policies of the state of Israel is to be considered anti-Semitic or uh, accusing a Jew for, you know, double loyalty to Israel and or, or usually typically it would be that the Jews are more loyal, you know, the Jew in Chicago is more loyal to Israel than to the U.S. That is anti-Semitic. Calling Israel a racist endeavor is anti-Semitic according to this uh, uh, definition. So, and so I think we need to use those tools. Now, this definition was uh, accepted, endorsed by um, over 30 countries, including the U.S., and the State Department uh, uses it. Um, and the European Union is now, has produced a, a handbook on uh, how this definition should be applied. Because imagine a, a situation... Uh, an example from 2009, if I'm not mistaken, in Wuppertal, in Germany, there was an arson attempt on a local synagogue, and uh, two Palestinian individuals got arrested for an attempt arson. And the judge uh, ruled that it was not a hate crime. Why? He said... He explained it was not a hate crime because they were merely expressing their frustration over a political situation in Palestine. Now, today, that would not happen because today Germany applies this IHRA working definition also in training the judges and judicial officials, in training school teachers, because you need to also help a local school teacher uh, know when an incident in school or on campus or anywhere was actually an anti-Semitic incident or not. So it, it, it's both, but, but we should use this uh, also to sanction, right? We, this should guide P law enforcement officers when they're making an arrest and so on. So we can use this tool both to educate and to better equip basically different peers in our society that, that are supposed to help society deal with anti-Semitism better, right? Because if a local teacher or principal or, uh, or anyone, right, does not know what constitutes anti-Semitism, and we should not assume that everyone does, then, you know, then they're, they're, and they're the first on the, on the line of fire when there's an incident. Um, and at the same time, we should use it uh, to show a firm uh, a firm stand that once caught in promoting anti-Semitism, it, it will not be tolerated. Olga, I want you to talk also about the role the media has in stoking the flames of anti-Semitism. As we record this, the Washington Post um, featured a photo of a measles outbreak in Ohio and showed a Hasidic community then in New York City. And... You know, yeah. yeah, I mean, well, how do we I mean, where do we even go with that? <laughs> I 
media plays an extremely important role. We live in, in a global society uh, where news travel in seconds from one side of the world to the other side. Languages are not no barrier anymore. Uh, the entire world has become a village. Uh, traditional media plays a very important role, but the social media plays an even greater role. Um, both are, are led by a rule that good news is no news, and we are all after sensations and scandals. Um, and, and there is something in, uh, in uh, literature that is called the fringe theory, particularly in the context of media. And it says that basically the fringer the, the news is, the higher the chances that the media will cover it because it's going to be shocking, right? It's going to be a sensational uh, uh, title. But that will automatically provoke an even fringer response on the other side of the spectrum. And by, by, by giving it a platform, basically we stretch the discourse to, the, to its um, uh, extremes and we grant the stage to the fringest instead of to the, because the majority of people are somewhere in, in the middle, right? Uh, but the media tends to give a uh, platform and the stage to the craziest statements, to the fringest uh, uh, examples and social media even more. Social media go, takes it to the next level because basically you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to have any credentials you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to prove to anyone that you're an expert on any one issue, but you become a source of information and you can gain traction in no time and rally followers and be the main source of information. We also know that the um, the uh, the way that the social media works is that the more you read, the more you will read my Facebook page, the, the higher the chances that you will only see me and another 15 people in your feed all the time. So in a way, in social media, we tend to live in, in each in, in his or her respective uh, echo chamber that feeds itself. And then, but we tend to, whether we want it or not, we tend to base our opinions on that. Uh, I, I think that, if, that also younger generations, because of the globalization and because the how easy, how much of an access they have to everything online. Um, they vet their sources of information a little less than maybe we used to because we just had to hit the library. <laughs> we had well, no they don't choice. question things, do they? I find that people aren't asking the whys anymore and they're not really drilling down into anything. They're just taking the headlines as yeah. fact and that's it. You know, I mean, if you, if you think about it, um, when I listen to the Israeli primetime uh, news in the evening, uh, I can't give you an exact an exact percentage, but a lot of the items begin with such and such tweeted today. I mean, this is where yeah. this is where the news uh, are today. So there was a story yesterday <laughs> on on CNN, and it said, I, I don't want to say exactly what it was because I don't want to get into politics, but something may have occurred. And they spent the next five minutes talking about this, something that may have occurred. May have occurred and I yeah. thought, you're a journalist. Why don't you really dig into it or ask questions, get down to it and give us some facts rather than something may have happened and then just fill up airspace with that. I know. I just hope that everyone in earshot here, we do have, as I said, a very intelligent audience, Olga. And I know that our listeners actually do do a lot of questioning. So we hope that they'll spread the word that really, if you hear a story or you hear a report, you have to go and read between the lines and you have to ask even more questions to get to the truth. Absolutely. And we have seen this, um, you know, uh, during the last round of, uh, of um, conflict uh, between Israel and Gaza, right? And Hamas. Um, there was an image that was shared on literally every media outlet in a matter of minutes of a Palestinian father holding his uh, bleeding child, you know, and the, the, the news said that he was hit uh, by the, Israel the IDF uh, soldiers. And it, it, it went around the world. By the time that the, the IDF went and researched and so on and came out when, and showed that it was actually 
a photoshopped image from a child from Aleppo in Syria, it didn't even matter anymore because the image that that uh, that went around the world did its job, which is create a, uh, an emotion. And I think that's also part of the problem that a lot of the news today are emotional, either 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 uh, aimed at creating an emotion, an emotional reaction, or are a pure commentary. We have too much of today's journalism uh, served to us as political commentary. We, you will sell them. I mean, I, I don't want to be uh, dismissive. You know, journalism is a very serious profession, and there's many, many serious uh, journalists. But, but I, I, there is a trend where more and more we we read commentary by by serious journalists as well, where they they start with an opinion, and then they they develop an opinion instead of bring news to us and journalistic research and. And somewhere there is the is the problem, especially in today's woke and uh, progressive discourse, where it's tricky to say certain things, where we need to tiptoe around certain issues, um, and the whole and Israel was caught in the middle of that um, by many and captured as the pariah, and and I think that is the that is that is why. You know, going back to the very beginning of our conversation today, if I had to say in one line what it is that we do at NGO Monitor, it is exactly that. We try to defend Israel's right to exist as a Jewish democracy in that human rights space where it is being attacked today. You know, Olga, they say uh, facts don't care about feelings and feelings don't care about facts. Right? Well... <laughs> yeah, there's there's something to that, but uh, but um, but at, we at NGO Monitor we we stick to the facts right. because uh, because we do believe that at the end of the day trends come and go, mm -hmm. and uh, emotions come and go. Uh, but, but the facts are still the there. The facts are still there. I told you before we started rolling, I'm a, I'm a Mandarin speaker, and Deng Xiaoping, the former paramount leader of China, used to invoke a Chinese expression, shi shi tio shi, which means seeking truth from facts. It's a very well-known Chinese saying. So I think what you're doing at NGO Monitor is really seeking truth from facts. You have been so incredibly generous with your time. I just have a couple of really quick bases to get to before we actually sign off. Um, the first is you talked about Zionism. So I'm really curious, um, what is your definition of Zionism and what portion or aspect of Zionism are you most proud of? And I'm asking that in the context of Jewish National Fund USA's whole year long campaign called Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. It's meant to show the beauty and the inclusivity of what Zionism is all about. And in fact, we encourage everyone in earshot to go on to youtube.com forward slash Zionism studios to catch these really important conversations. I've learned a ton myself. So what's your definition of Zionism and what aspect is Olga most proud of in the whole ecosphere of Zionism? Wow. That's such a, such a big question. Should I have um, you back to talk about that? <laughs> um, well, first of all, ha happy to. <laughs> yes. Anytime. I think this is going to be the first of many conversations <laughs> that we're going to have you on the program because there's certainly no shortage of topics to discuss. Yeah, it would be my pleasure. Um, to me, Zionism is an integral part of my Judaism. I don't set them apart. Um, Jews pray and they turn to Jerusalem and everything begins and ends and evolves around this piece of land and our connection to it. That does not mean that all Jews should live in Israel or should choose Israel as their physical homeland. But uh, to me, Zionism is uh, an eternal connection between this land and the Jewish people and the Jewish people and this land. Um, throughout history, there th that connection was, you know, emerged and evolved and, and developed and changed. Uh, I think we live in very unique uh, historical moment. We're almost experiencing a miracle, if you'd like, because um, uh, the state of Israel is nothing short of a miracle. 
uh, with all, you know, everyone knows the history and the wars and everything. But even if you think about it, all the terror attacks and, and the hostile environment and everything, and, 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 and yet we have a thriving country, uh, a thriving society here. Um, I think uh, the new geopolitical order in the Middle East with Abraham Accords is an incredible testimony to how illuminous Zionism is because it is being light onto the nations, right? It is it is breaking those that glass ceiling. Um, to me, Zionism should be um, something that connects all Jews around the world. Sadly, today it is not. And I think we need to reclaim that uh, that space and I think we need to I, I see that as one of our greatest tasks as the Jewish people in 2023 or in the 21st century to reclaim the positive meaning of Zionism internally for, for ourselves um, and in parallel to my uh, uh, my work at NGO Monitor I'm also proud to serve on the ex extended executive of the World Zionist Organization exactly uh, because I think that this is what we need to this is what we need to do. Um, what I'm most proud of, um, well, definitely the most proud of having created a family in Israel and having chosen Israel as my homeland. I moved here after a long journey <laughs> across many countries, <laughs> um, and I am. Um, I get emotional every time when I just think about it, that both my kids were born in Israel and they're Israelis. I'm always going to be on Olah Hadasha. I'm always going to be a new immigrant. It doesn't matter how, you know, how long I, uh, I live in Israel, but both my kids are Israelis and their first instinct is it's, it's almost uh, incredible to, to see the, the cultural difference between them and me. And I'm, I'm incredibly uh, proud of myself for having made that, uh, that move. Um, and I'm also proud, I'm proud of having made a full circle personally. Um, I come from Serbia, from former Yugoslavia, and I was rescued twice by the state of Israel. Uh, first time when the war in Bosnia erupted in 1992, and, and then the second time in 1999 when NATO bombed Kosovo and Serbia. And um, I had... Jewish organizations like the JDC joined and the Israeli national institutions like the Jewish agency uh, rescue us and, and absorb us here in Israel and so on. And I have made a full circle now having moved to Israel um, and I'm able to now give back both in my work through NGO Monitor in defending uh, Israel and defending Judaism and fighting anti-Semitism, but also with my work at the World Zionist Organization in in uh, giving back to, to global Zionism. So somewhere in between these things, you know, <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> right. It is. It's a full circle moment, indeed. Well, listen, on that note, we're going to leave it right there. As I said, this is going to be the first of many conversations that we're going to have with you, Olga. So truly want to thank you for joining us here on this episode of Israel Cast. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen, and I look forward to uh, to the to other opportunities to talk to you. Oh, so do I. But in the meantime, we'll have info about Olga and everything that NGO Monitor does on the show notes page of this episode on our website, jnf.org slash Israelcast. And before we move on with a little housekeeping, just want to, want to remind you what we were just talking about, the Jewish National Fund USA believes the time has come for us to reclaim the narrative, take ownership of the word Zionism, and show the world how beautiful, inclusive, and inspirational it really is. So do join Jewish National Fund USA's Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. It's a year-long campaign which will educate, engage, and inspire on the true meaning of Zionism and reclaim its true meaning in all its glory. So do log on to youtube.com forward slash Zionism Studios. Once again, youtube.com forward slash Zionism Studios to catch those truly, truly enlightening conversations. Now, as for Israel Cast. 
We do release new episodes of the show every other Wednesday. And just so you never miss an episode, how about subscribing to us wherever you get your podcast? It's so easy. Simply search for Israel Cast. And of course, don't forget to rate and review us because that really helps us with our rankings, which in turn make it easier for more people around the world to find us and to listen to people just like Olga. Or you can always enjoy the show by visiting us at our website once again. Hope you got it by now. It's jnf.org slash IsraelCast. Now it takes a whole Moshav to put Israel Cast together. For that, we thank Vivian Grossman, Dara Shapiro, and J.D. Krebs. Our editors are Jay Rothman and James Casada from Miratone Studios right here in the very heart of New York City. And the music that you hear at the top and tail of the program is titled My Eden. It's by the very talented Rafi Malkiel from his album Water on the Tzadik label. Israel Cast is indeed powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. For more info about JNF USA, visit JNF.org. And if you'd like to write to us with story ideas or just to say hello, we'd all love to hear from you. So do email us at IsraelCast at JNF.org. Meantime, I'm Stephen Shalowitz. thanking you for tuning in and looking forward to having you join us on future episodes of IsraelCast.